learning never ends at McMaster. Welcome to an opportunity to engage your curiosity from the comfort of your own environment. This online series is sponsored by the McMaster Alumni Association as part of our goal to connect with our global alumni and their curious minds. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us on this webinar. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of this presentation. Uh, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and I'm going to try to answer as many questions as possible. My name is Joe Kim and I teach introductory psychology at McMaster University. Psychology has deep roots in philosophy and physiology and We've been trying to answer some of the most uh, ancient puzzles in all of science. Uh, these are questions that maybe you've been thinking about. If you've ever thought about how accurate eyewitness testimony is, uh, if you've ever wondered how your performance might be affected by stress, if you've ever thought, are human beings the only living organisms that experience consciousness, then you two have asked questions that psychologists have been interested in and are trying to solve right now. How do we answer these types of questions? Well, psychology uh, is a science. And so what we're going to try to do doing is using the most accurate and objective information possible. And it's very important to use this type of process instead of just relying on common sense beliefs, assumptions, because we have biases and our own prior experiences that can filter what we see in the world. And so we need a really objective way of looking at things. So this is one of the lessons that I try to teach my students at the very first class uh, in psychology. And I think one of the most important things is to really have a curious mind, to really want to discover what's going on in the world. And before students get bogged down worrying about grades, I think many students walk into a psychology classroom really interested in trying to figure things out. And what I challenge my students to do is hold on to that sense of wonder. Um, so I happen to live with uh, one such scientist. Oh, sorry, before I get on to that, uh, I do want to mention why it's so important to think critically like this. Because I think in an age where we live with fake news, uh, there's also fake science stories. Uh, and there are things that come along in our social media feeds that are very easy for us to pass along. For example, Here's one that came along uh, my uh, social feed uh, in Facebook. Uh, this is a message that says that people say, uh, people say bless you when you sneeze because your heart stops for a moment. And this is one of those things that people read and think, oh, okay, that sounds kind of interesting and then kind of mindlessly pass that on. And when you pass on one of these types of stories, people think, well, okay, someone else passes along to me, it must be true. In the case of psychology, there are a lot of these such beliefs. And one of the things that I want to uh, uh, do in my course is to uh, get people to really think critically about the information that's out there, to, to treat yourself uh, as a scientist. So here's a scientist that I live with. Here's my daughter. Uh, she is very curious about the world. She is always asking questions. She's testing out ideas. Here she is just testing out whether or not uh, snowflakes can be held on her eyelashes. One day she asked me uh, the classic question, does the light in the fridge go out when you close the door? And rather than just giving her some sort of reflexive answer on what I think actually happens, I asked her and I challenged her and I said, well, what do you think happens when you close the light, close the fridge? Does the light actually go out? And she thought about it for a second and thought, I don't know but we can find out. And so I asked her, how can we find out? And she said, I got it. Let's take everything out of the fridge. I'll go inside the fridge, close the door, and I can tell you exactly what happened. So is that kind of wonder, like that kind of spirit of looking for answers that I think it's really important for us to keep alive in all of us. Um, now, to do this, uh, we also have to think critically. And what I would encourage people to do is when you're assessing information, when you're assessing a problem, to really think slowly about that problem. 
So in a great uh, work called Thinking Fast and Slow uh, by Daniel Kahneman, which summarizes a lifetime of research on what we know about the psychology of decision making, um, Daniel Kahneman talks about two systems of thinking. Uh, so in this metaphor, there's the system one, which is sort of fast and reflexive, uh, and there's system two, which is the slow, ethical type of thinking. And when you're thinking deeply about a problem that deserves your attention, what I encourage people to do is really take that time to engage in the system two level of thinking. System one is prone to biases and quick rules of thumb to make very quick decisions, but sometimes you really do need to take your time to really think uh, thoroughly through the information. So having said this, let me give you a question that tests whether or not you can engage in this effortful decision making. So here's the first question. A bat and a ball together cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. And I have a very simple question for you. How much does each item cost? So what I want you to do is not just reflexively give a answer. I want you to actually think about this, make some sort of calculation, and come up with an answer. Now, when I ask this question to my students on the very first day of class, about half the students get this question wrong. Uh, this involves very simple math, but I think what most people end up doing is going with a reflexive feel-good answer instead of making an actual calculation. So if you make a calculation here, you have two items together costing $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. Well, we can subtract a dollar off and we're left with 10 cents. And we have to divide that 10 cents between these two items. So we're left with 5 cents and $1 plus 5 cents. So the correct answer is 5 cents and $1.05. If you gave sort of a, uh, a feel-good, uh, reflexive answer, you might have answered $1.10. Okay, I think that explanation probably makes sense to you. Now I'm gonna challenge you to answer another question using the exact same mechanism. So this is what psychologists would call a transfer problem. If you truly understood this explanation, then you should be able to answer another question in a different context. So here we go. A BMW and a Tesla cost $160,000. The BMW costs $100,000 more than the Tesla. Then how much does each car cost? I hope you can get this question right. Uh, when I ask this question uh, to my students in my class, the first question, about half the people get it wrong. After I give the explanation, everyone nods their head and agrees, okay, yep, I get that. I asked them, if you, I gave this question on the final exam, would you get it right? And people say, of course. And here's the question. And now about a third of the class still gets this question wrong. So even though they thought they were paying attention and really following along with an explanation, they weren't necessarily engaging in that system two level of thinking. So what we're going to be doing in today, the rest of today's webinar is, I wanna give you some of the conclusions from an entire semester of taking introductory psychology. Now, the first thing I wanna talk about is how some of the things that you know to be true about psychology may actually be wrong. So here is your challenge. We're going to do a poll. So here are the options. Which of the following do you think is correct? We only use 10% of our brain. Individuals learn better when they receive their preferred learning style, for example, auditory, visual, or kinesthetic, or listening to music enhances cognitive abilities. Or do you think, D, I have serious problems with all of these options? Let me give you a moment to make your selection on what you think is correct here. So we can see some activity going on here in our poll. All right, the leading option so far, the most popular answer seems to be B. Okay, we're gonna end the poll here. Um, the most popular answer by far was B. Okay, so we're gonna close this poll. So we're gonna close this poll here. Yeah, and share it. Okay. All right, so then I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So let's think about uh, each of these options. The first one, we mostly use only 10% of our brain. Hopefully, uh, you read through uh, the description of this talk 
And you recall that one of the myths that I mentioned is that people think that we only use 10% of our brain. And in fact, this is the basis for a lot of self-help books. If we could only tap into that unused 90% of our brain, uh, just imagine uh, the things that we can do. Option C says, listen to classical music enhances cognitive abilities in babies. This is based on an actual study that was done uh, not in babies, but in university students. And they saw short-term benefits on a subset of an IQ test. This single finding has been misinterpreted into this idea that by playing classical music to individuals, uh, to babies, that we can alter their uh, developmental trajectory and perhaps even make them into geniuses. Um, and option D, I have serious doubts for each of these. We had a few people uh, select that one, and I would say that is the best answer. Let's go on to B. Individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style. Now, this is a very popular idea. Uh, it's called the learning styles um, hypothesis. And a strong version of this hypothesis is that uh, we can identify different types of learning styles. The most popular are auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. There are even psychometric tests that have been developed. And once we've identified that learning style, if we can match up the teaching style to that, this will lead to improved academic performance. Unfortunately, uh, there are, there's no data to support this hypothesis. It sounds like a great idea. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't actually pass the scientific test. And what I really want you to think about is the implications that this has for educational policy. So for example, in some school districts that have really uh, embraced this idea of learning styles, uh, one, uh, one uh, implication was that, well, maybe if we go identify children's learning styles earlier and earlier, we can get even better benefits. And so in some school districts, preschool children uh, are tested and then literally labeled uh, V, A, and K to identify their preferred learning style. Um, in other uh, 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 school districts, uh, teachers uh, create posters and they use this idea as a general guideline for how they can identify learning style. Here is a poster from a teacher that um, promotes this idea that by just looking at the direction of gaze from a student while they're trying to solve a problem, whether they're looking straight ahead, up, or side to side, you could do a quick uh, diagnosis of whether or not they're a kinesthetic, auditory, or visual learner. Um, there's no basis for this as well, unfortunately. Um, in fact, in addition to these three learning styles, there are dozens of other learning styles that have also uh, been theorized. And you know a theory is starting to get in trouble when the online uh, satirical news source, The Onion, starts lampooning you. Uh, so here's an article I found on The Onion that says parents of nasal-based learners push for an odor-based curriculum. All right, the second conclusion that I want to talk to you about is how perspectives in psychology change the focus of research questions we pursue and the types of answers that we find. And so in science uh, and psychology uh, as well, different types of research questions can uh, become popular, uh, different methods can become popular, and these can drive the specific types of research questions that we are looking for and the types of answers that we find. So on the first day of class, I tell my students about the most famous horse in the history of psychology. Uh, this horse was called Clever Hans, and he could do some amazing things. You could ask Clever Hans a math question. So if you asked him what is two plus two, he would stomp its hoof four times and give you the correct answer. You could ask this horse yes or no questions, and it could give you logical answers that conform to the question that you're asking. Um, so I, I present this case to my students, and I challenge them to come up with a research question that would help us to understand what is going on with this horse. Is this horse special? Uh, does it have above average intelligence? Is there some sort of trick going on? And for some classes, uh, I vary the amount of research grant money that they have. In some classes, I might give them $100,000. A 
another class, I might give them a million dollars. Some classes, I might just give them a hundred dollars. And I want to see what type of research questions that they come up with. Now, the class that gets a million dollars, they start asking some very uh, complex, high-tech questions. So they suggest things like, well, let's do some sort of gene chip analysis. Let's create some sort of horse fMRI so we can see what's happening and scan the brain. Or let's create some sort of artificial intelligence can direct, that can directly communicate with that horse. Now, the class where I offer only $1,000, they don't have these uh, technology options open to them. So they have to ask different types of research questions. So, for example, they might focus on a behaviorist explanation. Are there some sort of cues or signaling behavior that uh, explain what's going on? As it turns out, this problem can be solved by looking at a behaviorist perspective. So, this horse, Clever Hans, uh, he was quite clever. And what he did was, whenever he was asked a question, so if you asked, what is four plus one, he would start stomping its hoof. And then right around the fourth time he stomped its hoof, the audience watching would sort of get on the edge of their seat, looking expectantly, wondering, is he going to get this right? And when Clever Hans observed this behavior in the human beings, he knew that he just had to do one more stomp and this would lead to applause and reward from the audience. So this kind of explained what was going on. So my point here is that uh, all scientists are following some sort of research paradigm that helps them to figure out what type of question that they should ask. If we looked at the history of psychological disorders uh, and we look back to very early uh, investigations into what's going on, uh, one such belief was that there were evil spirits that were uh, inhabiting uh, inside the head of a person experiencing psychological disorder. And a solution would be to use a method called trephining, where you can drill a hole into the skull, releasing uh, uh, the, the evil spirits. Now, we can look at uh, something like this and think, well, that, how could someone think that that is the correct answer? But each of us is also being guided by a very specific set of research questions that are dictated by our paradigm. So currently, we follow what some people might characterize as a reductionist approach to psychological disorders. Uh, our underlying belief is that at some point, we can understand all of the functions of the brain. And if we can understand the functions of a healthy brain and an unhealthy brain, then we might be able to come up with some sort of treatment that helps that unhealthy brain act more like a healthy brain. Now, this is obviously a research paradigm that we are in now. We believe it to be true. But perhaps a uh, hundred years from now, other students are going to be looking back at us at this point and thinking how could they have been so reductionist in their thinking that they could target very specific connections between neurons without affecting um, brain uh, connectivity in other regions. Okay, the third conclusion uh, that I want to talk about is that we only have access to a limited subset of reality. So each of us walks around thinking that we're taking in pretty much all of our surroundings uh, that we are aware of all of the different sensory stimuli, but we only have access to a limited subset of this reality. Now, here is a very dramatic demonstration how we only pay, atten pay attention to a limited subset of information. Even if information crosses our visual field, if we're not paying attention to it, it might not be processed. So in this study by Dan Simons, that man is, uh, one man is being replaced by another man in mid-conversation. And the question is, will the man in the beard notice that he's speaking to a completely different person? Now, you might think to yourself, yeah, if that happened to me, if, if uh, someone's body was swapped uh, in mid-conversation, I would notice for sure. But in these studies, about half people don't realize that they're speaking to a different person. So what that shows is that we can only pay attention to a limited set of the information that's coming in from our environment. Okay, here's one more demonstration. 
What I want you to do is pick one of these five cards and then focus on it. Really focus on that card. And there are many people online right now. What I'm gonna try to do is I'm going to specifically take away your card. Okay, so focusing on your card, here we go. Now we're gonna take a quick poll to see how, how accurate I was here. Please let me know if I took away your card. So far, it looks like I've taken everyone's card away. One person says no. Let's share this poll just to show. Um, so that's pretty amazing, isn't it? I was able to take away everyone's card. You might be wondering how I could possibly do that. Well, here's the trick. I asked you to focus specifically on your card, what you met, and here's a slide where I showed you uh, uh, where you picked your card. I asked you to focus specifically on your card. And while you're doing that, uh, even though the other cards did cross your visual field, you may not have been paying cl close attention to it. And so, you're looking for your card here and you don't realize that these are actually just four brand new cards that I presented to you. Okay. Finally, your perception of the world is guided by prior experiences, biases, and heuristics. And so all of your, each of us carries our own personal baggage into every situation that we encounter. And through a process called top-down processing, these prior experiences and our expectations shape exactly what we experience in the environment. So when I'm talking about language, for example, one of the challenges is something called the language stream segmentation problem. So right now there's a stream of audio being presented to you and somehow you have to segment these sounds into separate words. And even though sometimes I might be speaking quickly or slowly, you still know how to recognize speech. Now, what you probably think I just said is how to recognize speech. That is not what I said. What I just said was how to wreck a nice beach. So these sounds are what actually reached your ear but most of you, I'm sure, probably heard me saying how to recognize speech because that is what would fill, fit in with the context of what I'm saying here right now. This is an example of top-down processing. So your expectations, your experiences with language have directly interacted with these stimuli that are incoming to your ears, leading you to hear something different from what was actually presented. We're going to skip through this demonstration because I don't think the audio is working. Okay, what do we talk about today? The main conclusions we came to are that, first of all, some of the things that you know to be true about psychology are wrong. Maybe for psychology more than any other science, this is particularly true because so many things that we study in psychology are very popular. They are passed along in social media. One of the things I ask you to do is check your sources. If something seems to be really interesting to you, before you accept it and pass it on, check out where that information is coming from. Secondly, perspectives in psychology change the focus of research questions and the answers that we seek. So this is something that affects scientists and it affects consumers of information as well. Third, all of us only have access to a limited subset of reality. We can't pay attention to all of the noise in our environment. Some of that noise is important signal and we have selective processes to pick out that signal. But there's a lot of information that, uh, that whizzes by us that we don't even uh, notice. And fourth, each of us has our own biases. So our perception of the world is guided by our prior experiences, by our expectations and heuristics that allow us to make quick and easy decisions. Now, the next time you do come across uh, a piece of information uh, in your social media, before passing it on, think about where that came from, 
Think about how credible that source is. And if possible, go out and collect your own information and data. So when my daughter then asked me, but does the light in the fridge go out when you close the door? Uh, when she first suggested that we uh, empty everything out of the fridge and she will go inside that fridge and then I will close the door and she can tell me what happened. But that's a pretty good idea. That's a good direct observation, but I don't think we can do that. Can you think of something else that we can do? She thought for a moment and said, I got it. Let me use your phone. And she made a video and she put that camera in the phone in the fridge to see what happened. And here is that video. So in case you're wondering, yes, the light does go out in the fridge, but you should find out for yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, if you enjoyed this uh, webinar, please feel free to post questions, comments, uh, links. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Prof Joe Kim. If you're also interested in watching further uh, short engaging presentations from teaching assistants in my introductory psychology class, please check out PND Talks at the MacIntropsych.com website. Thank you, and now it's time for our Q&A session. So if you have a question, just click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Okay, our first question comes from Christine, who asks, if learning styles aren't scientifically proven, why do schools still talk about learning styles? That's a great question. So I, uh, my research area is in education and cognition, and this is one of the most common things uh, that comes up. Uh, if you type in learning styles on Google, you'll come across new articles that talk about it every day. And the underlying assumption is that there must be data that supports this idea. And in fact, uh, it's a multi-million dollar business doing psychometric testing about uh, determining exactly what your learning style is. Um, I think a few of the reasons why uh, it's so emphasized is that one, uh, it feels good. It sounds, uh, it has uh, intuitive appeal. Uh, it sounds like almost a fair idea. If we could just figure out what learning style you are, you could, too could improve your academic performance. Um, and secondly, um, it's, uh, it's become ingrained in educational policy and curriculum. Uh, and the underlying assumption is that there must be data that backs this up. Unfortunately, if you go through and do uh, uh, some background research, you'll find that there aren't studies that directly support this idea. Okay, a follow-up question. Okay, from Aseo. So if we don't have different learning styles, then how do we know what is the best way to study? Well, the best way to study, that is something that uh, people like me are really interested in uh, trying to figure out. So. We have over 150 years of formal research uh, from laboratory studies on uh, attention, memory, learning. And uh, in more recent years, uh, uh, scientists, psychologists have been really interested in taking that information and transferring that into the classroom education and training scenarios. So there are several things that we know uh, are good. Uh, so first of all, instead of just rereading your notes or highlighting, one of the best things to do is actually practice retrieving that information. Many students actually don't practice retrieving information until the day of the test. So practicing retrieving seems to strengthen that memory and spreading out that practice studying uh, across several days instead of cramming uh, is significantly better. So if you had four hours to prepare for a test, you could study that four hours the night before, or you could spread that four hours over two or three sessions leading up. Even though the time on task is the same, what we find is that spacing out that study is significantly better than cramming it all together. And there are many other things that uh, researchers have been looking at. Uh, I summarized some of these. If you go to macintropsych.com, I have uh, an hour long talk there on how the science of learning can be applied to academic success. Okay, we have another question here. How can we decipher what is true even when things are well sourced? The entire education board's using source material to derive lesson plans for visual, audio, 
and kin uh, kinesthetic learners? That is a really good question, uh, especially in the age of fake news. Uh, there are so many things that look like credible sources. Um, so whenever I go to a source and I've never heard of it before, say it's not from an academic institution or some sort of trusted news source, I'll dig in a little bit deeper to see exactly what that is. Uh, and oftentimes, it, uh, with just a little bit of digging, you can see that this is just a website that someone has put together. Um, uh, links and uh, references that people cite really lead to nowhere. Um, but it, admittedly, it can be very difficult. Um, so one of the things I think that is very important for psychologists and researchers to do is what we call knowledge translation to really um, help distill information uh, for the general public to really get out there and comment on important issues uh, and provide background and research to support that. But I, I do admit, I think it's a very challenging thing to do where people can create what sounds like credible resources. Okay, time for one more question. And a question comes from here. What are your thoughts on our ability to choose what information we retain? Is that a human capability that can be controlled or is it up to the totality of our consciousness and subconscious mind? Does everyone have the ability to ace every test? Well, that's a really good question. So I think uh, each of us does have different abilities. So, and so there's a, a, a cognitive function called working memory. And that is something that we could objectively measure. And if I gave a working memory test to 100 people, I could, I could see a distribution where some people will have a high working memory capacity, some people will have a low working memory capacity. Um, generally speaking, if you have a high working memory capacity, you will probably uh, do better in uh, some learning and problem solving tasks. But that's not to say that uh, that will determine everything. Um, there are strategies that, for example, I talked about retrieval practice, spacing out your studying, that benefits everyone, regardless of what your working memory capacity is. And so there are general things that people can do to overall improve uh, their problem-solving ability. Okay, uh, that's all the time that we have for today, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and we hope you'll continue to want information that feeds your curious mind. Um, this presentation was recorded and we'll send you a link along with a survey so that you can rewatch this and send this along to friends. Thank you very much and we hope you can join us again next time. Learning never ends at McMaster. Welcome to an opportunity to engage your curiosity from the comfort of your own environment. This online series is sponsored by the McMaster Alumni Association as part of our goal to connect with our global alumni and their curious minds.